Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the UFC card that's uh, this uh, Saturday from the Apex in Las Vegas, and it's the last slate before a uh, several week break. And I'm really looking forward to breaking this down because it's extremely thematic, and it's I find these these slates so interesting because they have such different characters um, one week after the other, and. Uh, when I saw the lineup for this week, I knew what was going to happen um, with respect to the breakdowns, and uh, it's not going to disappoint. It's only an 11 fight card, which means that you are probably going to be happy with, with winners from the underdogs, but yet still, um, it, it is a decent idea to go for upside. Um, as opposed to, say, like 13 fight cards where you must go for upside. And if, God forbid, there's a 10 fight card, you just any any winners are going to be good enough. But that's not the real issue here. The real thing that makes this card different than especially last week's is this. Last week, there were about six fighters that had inside the distance lines of uh, implied of minus 110 or, or, or greater. And there were several that had inside the distance lines of minus 300. Um, so you had five or six insane knockout props or early finish props that really drove the analysis. I mean, you needed to get to those in some way. Uh, and in, in the absence of that, there was like Lupe Gadinez, who didn't have this the correct, you know, this, the same inside the distance line. But we knew she had an incredible 130 point upside with her with her grappling. But the majority of it was with this, this slate that had all of these fighters with the with this these really strong inside the distance lines, where this card, just to cut right to the chase, there is literally one fighter on the whole card who is projected to finish his fight inside the distance. One. And I don't remember that being the case in almost any fight, any slate this whole season. Um, and let's get right to it. That fighter is Andre Fiala. So, so if you look at Andre Fiala, his inside the distance line is uh, Fiala inside the distance is you know minus one thirty eight, even with big, maybe it's minus one twenty, and nobody else is close. Okay, and nobody else is over minus one ten. So right off the bat, okay, Andre Fiala is going to rate to be an extremely strong player. So we put him in just for openers. And then we get to the real theme of this card. And that is this. I would say that of the other 10 fights, maybe nine of them, I mean, at least eight, seven at the minimum, are going to be determined by whether the wrestler can execute his or her game plan versus the striker. You have, I think, eight or nine fights where... There is literally one fighter whose win condition is predicated by him or her getting takedowns and the others whose win condition is predicated by him or her stopping the takedowns. And what that means is that we've got to figure out how many wrestlers are worth. It. Okay. Because the way that drafting scoring works just as a primer is that in the absence of a finish, the wrestler grappler is simply going to score more than the strike. That's just the way it is. So when you're comparing two fighters and, and one of them and all else being equal and one of them is, is the wrestler, you want to prioritize the wrestler because, you know, if in fact he or she wins, they're going to score well in decision where the striker, if they do not get the finish, is just not going to score well. Well, there are some exceptions with real high high volume strikers, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But in general, that's what you want to do is 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 just play the wrestlers. And I know what you're saying. You say, well, how do you know that they're going to get get the the game plan implemented? That's not even relevant. Okay, remember, this is not a betting show. We're not talking about whether they're going to actually get the wrestling implemented or not. All we're thinking about is if they do. What happens? You know, all that about whether they will do it or not is factored inside the lines already. Okay. Um, the only thing you do have to consider usually is the, the parlay of 
of whether they go for the game plan in the first place, plus or multiplied by the chance that it works. So we talked about that last week when it came to Lupe Godinez. So Lupe Godinez, she, her issue wasn't what happens if she goes for the takedowns. The issue was whether she was going to go for them. So her issue was you needed the parlay of him her going for the takedowns, you know, multiplied by the chance that it was working. That we knew there was about an eighty percent chance that if she went for the takedowns, it would it would smash. But about only forty percent or fifty percent of the time, we figured she would go for that. So that's what makes it difficult. But the thing is, on this card, with almost no exceptions, okay, we can count on a, a fighter's win condition to be predicated on his or her wrestling, okay? They're going to be, well, not going to be, there's always percentages, but it's extremely likely that part A of the parlay, like they decide to go for this, is, is not worried about, okay? Um, so we're, we're gonna just go through fight by fight, and I'm just gonna just sh show you what's going on here. I promise you that none of these inside the distance lines are really worth considering, and we'll go over them anyway, but. Let's just first start with Vidal versus uh, Rendon. Rendon is basically a, a, a boxer, okay? And, and Vidal has a combination of some takedown upside and as well, she's also probably a good striker as well. So let's take a look at her inside the distance line. Um, her inside the distance line is actually, it might be the next best one of the, I guess, of the non-main event, I guess. So Vidal inside the distance is plus 220. Actually, there's a little bit better than that, but her inside the distance line is plus 220. Plus, plus, she has some takedown upside. Um, now, her win condition is not explicitly determined by her ability to take the fights to the mat. So that's a little different than some of these others. But the fact that she has also an okay inside the distance line, and again, that's okay relative to the slate, plus she has some takedown upside, and it, she's going to be the one from this fight that gets the grappling points, okay? So right off the bat, Vidal, of these two is the one to play. Rendon is just not the one to play. Her, her win condition, she has no inside the distance line to speak of, and she's going to probably box with a, at an extreme disadvantage in the wrestling. So even if she does eke out the win, it's just not even really going to score all that way. Um, this next one is the only fight that does not, I believe, or at least, you know, it's close that it's not really a question of one one fighter is going to dominate in the wrestling, and that is Inoue versus Hannah Goldie. So neither of these fighters have particularly good wrestling, so we're just kind of relying on the inside the distance line. And as I mentioned earlier, like it's just it's just awful. Um, you have Inoue inside the distance is plus like two forty, okay, um, which is worse than Vidal. And she has no take that upside. So so I think Inoue is, is just a atrocious play, honestly, at 9,200. Now, again, if you get other lineups you like and you need to filter in some low-owned pieces, I think she's fine. But thematically, she's really just not a good play this week. Uh, and Goldie, I mean, she doesn't really have wrestling upside either. And, you know, her inside the distance line, just for fun, we'll look at it. It's like plus like a million. Okay. Um, so she's not playing. Either. So Jay Collier, Muhammad Usman. All right. So th this is actually another fight that is not exactly, you know, uh, thematic. Okay. Uh, this fight could go any which way. I mean, it's a, it's a low level heavyweight fight where you could, you could make the case for literally any result, here, you know, that, uh, Usman, you know, gets a KO. Usman for by decision. Collier by with takedowns. Usman by takedowns. But it's not completely clear who's going to do what. Okay, so in the absence of that, we go back. I think to the inside the distance lines to get started here, and you have Usman inside the distance plus three hundred, terrible. Collier inside the distance plus three hundred, terrible. They're both the same. So the fight is really only playable if you think one of them is going to get a bunch of takedowns. And I guess it's, it's possible that Usman can get takedowns. He did in his last fight, I suppose. Um, but he didn't really do much with them. So I, I think in this situation, this, this fight's probably, 
I don't want to say a pass, but I think it's it's certainly not as interesting. And, and I would at the most get with the field on, on either of these two fighters. It's really not thematic to what we're talking about. All right, so Jacob Malkoon versus Cody Brundage. I mean, Malkoon's a million to one favorite. And also, he just lets insane takedowns. I mean, you'll just look at him here. You have Malkoon's, let's just look, let's game log look here. Nine, seven, six, eight. You know what I mean? Like, he got cracked in 15 seconds in this, this ridiculous fight. But aside from this, he gets literally like, a you know, eight, six, seven, nine takedowns. And you have Brundage, who has just bad cardio. He he's supposedly a wrestler, but he just was just just awful in his last fight against Dumas. And I I, I think that the, the the narrative here is that they gave him one more fight before they're going to cut him. So he's probably going to go out and try to get a first round KO or something because he's not gonna not gonna be able to deal with Malcoon over over three rounds. So. Unfortunately, Brundage is not, you know, he doesn't win often enough for me to play him. And I heard, I've heard the case made to go play Brundage because what if he gets him out of there in the first round? It's one path to victory, but it just really just doesn't happen all too often. Um, and uh, I think people are just over remembering Malcoon getting knocked out in the first round. Um, I mean, this is just a kind of a smash play for Malcoon if you can get him in. He's got just all the grappling, all the wrestling upside in the world, and you just you just want to try to play him. Uh, then you get to uh, we already talked about the Means Fialho fight. Uh, if Means were like a takedown guy, um, I think that see, I think that Means is probably going to be in play here because again, we're talking about what happens if, in fact, he wins. So he's probably going to be going for takedowns here, I suppose. I don't know how else he's going to to, 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 to win this fight. So if, in fact, he wins, it's going to be because I believe he gets takedowns. So because Fialo is going to be, I imagine, really popular because he's the only inside the distance line of minus 110, I think means it certainly becomes in play here. Then we get to the next, like, very thematic fight. You have Miles Johns Ooh. versus Dan Argetta. You know, Dan Argetta is just a, a cardio machine. Well, cardio machine, sorry. he's a kind of a wrestling machine. He's like all action. Uh, two fights ago, he got four takedowns. His last fight against who was supposedly an equal, if not better wrestler or grappler, he, he got a takedown and a reversal, and he was about to submit the dude before he uh, before the fight got called. Uh, as I think it was a, the referee stopped it unintentionally you know, unintentionally or something like that. They thought he submitted when he didn't. Yeah, Miles Johns on the other side of this, who's you know, he has a wrestling background, but he's basically abandoned that. So if he we have a fight here, which is 8,600, 7,600, and I really don't know who's going to win, but you look at the the inside the distance lines for both fighters, and you have Miles Johns at 7,600. He is what's him? He is minus plus 400. We just can't play that, right? And Daniel Argetta, even though he has doesn't have the greatest inside the distance line, let's look at it. Like, plus two thirty actually is not that bad. He carries with it so much wrestling upside that again, if in fact he wins, it's going to be because he's getting a bunch of takedowns, racking up a bunch of points. I mean, you consider that along with his inside the distance line, which is not terrible. I mean, his win condition is just way too good, you know. To, to keep him out of your lineup. So again, we're trying to build this like portfolio of like preferred plays of these fights. And I couldn't imagine playing Miles Johns with the exception of to you know to be contrarian, you know, to because I think Argetta is going to be pretty popular um for all the reasons that I just mentioned. So you can listen, you can always play these opponents just as a way to get leverage. Um but unless Miles Johns has some other way to to score points. Uh, I, I don't think this is the correct leverage play. Okay, I'll just put it that. Then we get on to our next one, which is another one. You have Charles Jordan versus Ricardo Ramos. Um, it's it's a really close fight on the board. You know, Charles Jordan is eighty three hundred, so I imagine his his fight odds should be about minus one forty or something like that. Yeah, about that. 
So there's no real line value here. Jordan's inside the distance line at, at 8,300 really needs to be about plus 250, hopefully better. Um, but on this card, if it's plus 250, that's going to be good enough. That's actually not that bad. So Jordan at plus 180 is actually not that bad given the context of the slate. Now, Ramos, he has a poor inside the distance line, but another, again, again, this is another style matchup where if, in fact, Ramos wins, it's going to be because he was able to get takedowns, okay? He's not going to win, like, an at-range striking battle with Charles Jordan. Charles Jordan has been taken down. People have been, you know, uh, engaging in takedowns against him. So if Ramos can get that going, if he wins, it will be because he got that going. So, again, uh, I think Ramos is – I think both sides of this fight are actually really good, you know. Uh, Ramos, in his decision wins, I think he scores extremely well. And I think Jordan, as a combination of his volume and his okay inside the distance line, I think that he is actually a good play as well. So this is the first fight where I really like both sides. Um I think Fialo means is actually okay also, but Ramos, Jordan, certainly I like both sides. Um, all right. Uh, next one. AJ Fletcher versus Brian Battle. This is probably the second fight where I can, can go with both sides, maybe. First of all, the, the clear, the clear, I think, most popular underdog on the slate has just got to be A.J. Fletcher, with the exception of maybe the main event. I mean, you look at this guy, and at 7,500, you know, he's got not so much as his, uh, uh, his last couple of fights, but he he his, he is a wrestler, and he was able to get four takedowns against Semmelsberger. Um, so, you know, in his wins against Battle, He's pro it's going to be because he was able to get the wrestling going or, or the other thing about Fletcher is he certainly does bring the heat. Right. So, so he could actually also win by some other method, by some KO or even a really high pace decision um, with a lot of volume. So again, is he going to win? I don't, but if in fact he wins, he's just going to score really well. So I think he's going to be really popular. And I, and I think for good reason. Um, and then on the other side of the of, of the of the of the cage here, we have Brian Battle. And at 8,900, let's just take a look at this. Um, his inside the distance line is is just going to be okay, you know, like plus 170. But again, on a card like this, that's actually not bad. And the other thing is that he's got a little bit of wrestling in him as well. Um, the only problem is is that on the defensive side, he hasn't been so terrific. You know, we got ragdoll by by uh by this russian a few few fights ago i mean a really really good fighter but um so i do think the battle is 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 certainly in play and the other thing about the battle plays i do think fletcher is going to be the most popular underdog so if you do play battle you're getting good leverage i think and it's not just leverage for leverage's sake i think on his own he's probably a really good play okay so that's again i've been really that's a concept I've been pounding away um, recently in MMA is that if you really want a great GPP play, what you'll do is you'll find one play, which is amazing. Okay. It looks awesome. And then see if their opponent is an okay. play. Okay. I use, uh, there's one fight I use as an example. Like Derek Lewis was in a fight, like was it a month or so ago, against uh, Rodrigo de Lima. And Rodrigo de Lima has had, had incredible metrics. He had he was getting line value. He had an inside the distance line of like minus one ten. I mean, he's only like eighty seven hundred or something like that. He was an amazing play. But the thing is, everybody saw that he was an amazing play. And Derek Lewis on the other side was an okay play in and of his own self. Okay, so when you have an amazing play that's going to garner ownership. But on the other side, you could have an okay play. The okay play can often be just as good, if not better, than the amazing play. So I think battle is going to be a pretty good, good GPP option here because I do think that Fletcher is going to be is going to be relatively I think it's going to be extremely popular. Okay, and then we get to uh, Marina Rodriguez versus Michelle Watterson Gomez. 
All right. So if you want to, um, uh, if you want to win, if you want to win the, uh, the, the, the Millie maker, whatever you call it, whatever, you want to win the lottery and it's an 11 fight slate. I think this is the one you're going to have to do. Like, I, I hate to be this person I, I'm, to recommend this, but I really think you have to play Michelle Watterson in, in, in the MME uh, in the lottery because everybody's going to be looking at the same thing I'm looking at. You're looking going to look at these elite wrestling options, okay, from from even as the underdogs, from uh, our, our again, it's 8,600 or whatever, but, but uh, Fletcher, um, who is the other one? Fletcher was ob was obviously the big one, but they're going to try to play Bryce Mitchell. They're going to play Gamrot. Like these are like the popular wrestlers, but they're not going to play Michelle Waterston. Um, she's thirty five years old. Like all the reasons you wouldn't want to play her. She's it's a women's fight, which is just placed right in the in the mix of this nonsense. You know what I mean? Like I don't know anybody who's really going to play this, but but the concept is the same. You know, like. If, if in fact um, Michelle Waterson Gomez wins this fight, it's going to be because she got takedowns. Okay. She goes for takedowns, you know, uh, in the Angela Hill fight. I mean, she, she, listen, she beat Angela Hill and she got a takedown against her. And she is, she, she, Angela Hill showed she had pretty good takedown defense against what well, I'll the aforementioned, you know, Lupe Godinez, for example. Um, so, Listen, she did get a takedown against Rodriguez, and she lost. Listen, a really hard fought, you know, five round decision against her. Um, and the thing is, is that just she's going to be just so low owned. She has only about a plus two fifty win odds, so she's only going to win the fight about thirty percent of the time. But I don't know, man. Maybe, maybe that's enough. So that's going to be my. Sheets is a moron play of the week. And, and I think Michelle Waterson is, is very is a very reasonable thematic play, which people are not going to remember is a thematic play. Like I think that if there were not seven other fights that look like that look like this, in other words, like these grappler versus striker matchups, I think people might look at this fight and say, ooh, Waterson could probably get maybe get a takedown or two and maybe be a good underdog or something like that. But I think because there's so many better plays that I think the Waterson is going to be extremely low owned, um, and the concept is the same. I mean, think about the slate in another way. Like, if, if all these favorites win, okay, um, like if if Malcoon wins, if if Fialo wins, if 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 um, what's his name, if if AJ Fletcher loses, you know, if if you get, need these underdogs, let's say Vidal loses or Vidal doesn't score too well. Um, excuse me, let's say Vidal wins or whatever it is. So you, you lose, have all these underdogs lose and you get Michelle Waterson to sneak in with like a win there um, at 10% ownership. I think in, in the big field MME, I think it's worth a shot. 20 max and below, no, but... And Marina Rodriguez, uh, no thanks. She's, you know, her inside the distance line, I presume, is extremely poor. We'll take a look at it. Um... Marina Rodriguez inside the distance at plus 350 at that price. just not happening for me. So now we get to the two big fights. Um, Bryce Mitchell versus Dan Ige. And again, this is this is a, a, a DFS show, a DFS analysis. We're not going to go into who we think is going to win or what's going to happen or who's going to implement their game plan. All we're thinking about is what happens if something happens. And I've heard a lot of reasons why Bryce Mitchell is 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 bad chalk. I've heard that he tried to retire after his last fight. I've heard he got beat up so badly that he just never gonna recover from that. I've heard that I've heard that Ige is gonna have motivation because he's from Hawaii. And Bryce Mitchell was saying that the Hawaii hurricane was fake news. You know, there's all kinds of of Bryce Mitchell. You know, like people, tr not necessarily trying to fade him, but whatever, coming up with reasons why Dan Ige might be kind of like a sharp play or whatever. And it's possible. You know, Bryce Mitchell minus 200 might not be a great play. But the fact of the matter is, is that he's going to be going for takedowns. And if, th if things go his way, he could score 130. Okay, he just can. And if, in fact, that happens, you just don't want to 
be on the outside looking into that minus one to that 130 points. So he's just got to be an incredible priority here. I mean, between him and listen, even Mal Malcoon, even, I mean, the, the, the scores that these guys can put up in wins, just doing what they normally do, you know, uh, is is just too hard to avoid. You know, it's not like you're playing a guy who, if he gets a first round KO, he can score 110, you know, meaning that he's got to do that in the first round. Here, the guys, just if he can just for it, it right, basically his normal fight, but things kind of go his way just a little bit. He could score 125, 130. That's just kind of difficult to to avoid. Um, okay, do you, can you play Dan Ige as a bit of leverage? Sure. Brian Mitchell is going to be extremely popular, okay? And if, in fact, he's, you know, on the outside looking in, even if his, his mental state is not great, even if, you know, it's possible that, I don't know, might have PTSD from his last fight, who knows? And Ige is just a better striker, and he has good takedown defense, and he grinds it out. Okay, I suppose. And yeah, there is, I guess, some Ige KO upside. So because Mitchell is going to be that popular, yes, I guess Ige's got to be a live underdog here. Um, but for but only for that reason. Uh, Fiziev Gamrot main event. Um, again, this is the this is the the, the capper, you know. Uh, Mateus Gamrot, and you just look at his game logs, it just kind of just it really tells you everything you need to know about this fight. Takedowns four, four, six, four, and six again was in a five round fight, fair enough. But you know, this is a five round fight, so again, it, it all extrapolates nicely. So if this fight goes decision, you know, he's if he's going to win, he's going to expect to score six takedowns, okay. Is he going to be able to do that against Fiziev? Again, that's a trick question. I don't care if he's going to be, to be able to. The answer is yes. He's going to be able to do that probably 45% of the time, right? Or 40% of the time. He's a minus 150 favorite or so underdog, or plus 150 underdog. He's probably going to do that 40, 45% of the time. But in a five-round fight where he gets six takedowns, that wins. It just does. So, so... He is just an insane play here, okay? Um, on the other side, now you have Fiziev, who has a lot going for him. Number one is that you have to imagine Gamma's going to be really popular. Um, so if you play Fiziev, you can get leverage against Gamma. And the other thing is that even though Fiziev doesn't have takedown upside, between his you know, relatively okay inside the distance prop, which is what here. Um, Fiziev inside the distance, like plus 140, plus the fact that he could put up a lot of volume over five rounds. I think that his floor in a win is like 90 um, or maybe even 95. And he does have some, some upside. So I think that both sides of this fight are, are certainly worth playing. So what, is, what does this mean to the average man? <laughs> As I like to say. Um, you really want to, to, to prioritize the guys with, with, the, with, the, with the wrestling, and you want to fade the fighters without. Okay. So I think you probably want to, you know, you want to fade Rendon. I'll probably have zero of her. You want to fade this whole fight in a way versus Goldie. This Collier Usman fight just kind of sticks in my craw a little bit sort of inclined to fade it, but in 150, I'll probably just kind of sort of get with the feel. I'm not going to play the Brundage thing. I'm just not doing it. Malcoon is just, you know, just way too likely to win. And he's just going to score when he wins. Uh, I think if, if there's a guy I might get off of a little here is maybe means, but in 150, you're just going to have to play him because Fialo is going to look like such a strong play. That I think means you'll get a little bit of leverage against that. So, um, Miles Johns, I, I can't imagine playing a share of him. The only thing I, I would say is that, again, if our ghetto, you know, is going to be popular, which it will be, you know, Miles Johns gets some leverage. But again, you, you, I just don't see the, you know, too much upside for him. You know, his decision wins are not going to be great. And his inside the distance line is poor. 
The Jordan Ramos fight uh, could go somewhat overlooked, specifically the Ramos side, but it's the same idea. You know, Ramos is is a good majority of his upside or his win condition is going to be from wrestling. So he's a very, very strong play. Uh, the battle Fletcher, I'll play both sides of that. And this could be the sneaker, you know, the Michelle Watterson. Um, uh, it's going to be the lowest stone of all the ones I've spoken about. And I think, uh, I think she's worth a stab. What can I tell you? Um, tomorrow we're going to do our betting breakdown. And, um, that's a much more contrarian approach, but you know, for, for lack of anything else, this is a good opportunity to like to to really think about wrestling versus versus you know grappling versus striking, and also ownership versus leverage. You know, like which of those smash plays really has an opponent that you can use as leverage? I think Ige. Well, I would say Fiziev, but Fiziev is not is he's already been really popular. I think Ige is going to be low owned, lower owned, obviously Mitchell. So I think he's a good one. And I think that's probably my favorite kind of like bit of leverage because I thought, I don't think battle is going to be that unpopular. You know what I mean? The, the medium price, price favorites rarely are. So I think Ige would be a good source of leverage. I think Michelle Waterston would be just a good old low piece of value. And if you play those two, then you could just jam in all these high-priced wrestlers if you wanted. And I think that's not the worst idea in the world. Uh, all right, that will do it. Good luck, everybody. And I'll see you for the betting breakdown probably tomorrow.